Well, friends, thank you for joining me for this Mass. Some of you who are joining are new to our ministry, and we welcome you warmly, whether you are Catholic or not. And you know our ministry is focused on one issue, which is abortion, the biggest and most destructive problem we have in the world today. Nothing takes more human life than abortion. And not only are we working to end this violence and to restore protection to the weakest, the most vulnerable human beings, the children yet in the womb, but I want to point out right from the outset that the bulk of our work and the work of the pro-life movement is serving people who are confused and afraid and feel they have to resort to abortion. Our work helps them find alternatives. There are people ready to help in so many different ways to provide medical and legal and financial services, to give counseling and assistance and a place to stay and friendship and hope and strength and uh, to, to assist them to, to find jobs and, and educational opportunities that they can pursue while being parents and to give them parenting classes and to make an adoption plan if that is their preference. There are so many ways. So much help that we can give people instead of letting them in despair go to abortion clinics. Friends, just know that that is at the center of the pro-life effort and websites like PregnancyCenters.org and uh, uh, so many other resources are there for these individuals and we're working to reach them all the time. And such a big part of our ministry is to help those who've already made this tragic mistake, those who have had abortions, to find mercy and forgiveness and healing. We oversee the world's largest ministry for healing over, uh, after abortion, Rachel's Vineyard. And so again, abortionforgiveness.com is the website where people find that kind of healing closest to where they might live. So that, that's the first thing to keep in mind when we talk about this subject. We are helping people find alternatives to abortion. We are helping people heal from the wounds. In addition to doing that, we have to bring an end to the violence itself. And that's where I want to share with you more deeply what these readings say and what they mean for us. If you know how to give good things to your children, how much more will the Lord give good things to you if you ask? That's the lesson from this gospel. It's interesting how God, in talking about his love for us, uses the analogy of a parent's love for his or her children. So basic in human relationships, so basic and essential to human society, that we care for our children, so easy to understand, so natural and so real. Of course we give good things to our children when they ask. A loaf of bread, a fish, all their daily needs, their food, their medical care, their education, their opportunity to choose their path in life, their religious formation, their leisure and, and sports activities and healthy entertainment. How much do parents want to give good things to their children? But what good thing above all do parents give to their children that is necessary in order for them to enjoy all these other good things? The answer is obvious. It's life itself. What good thing do parents give to their children above all? Life itself. And they do that in cooperation with the Creator because ultimately only He can give life. The only thing the parents can do is to say yes to creating those circumstances, those conditions that are capable of, but not, won't necessarily result in the beginning of a new human life. To come together in that loving embrace, physical as well as spiritual. To be open to life, to not do anything to hinder it deliberately. But then it's a gift after that. They come together, we want to have children, we try, try to have children. We're ready to welcome children. The child is always a gift. Can never be demanded. The child is not a right that we have. 
It's just that we go before the Lord and we come with, together with each other and we say, we're ready. We're ready, Lord, with a generous heart to receive the gift of new life. And so many parents are longing and yearning to receive that gift of new life. But it remains a gift. It cannot be demanded as a right, nor can it be discarded as a burden. And this is where abortion comes in. The child cannot be discarded. Once the child begins existing in the womb, that's a child. Before the child even gets to the womb, upon fertilization, that's a child. The child's life begins, as a matter of fact, before the parents even know it. Again, reminding us it's truly God's gift and God's initiative and God's choice and God's property. We don't own the child. What, who among you would not give your child what is good? The act of abortion is so unnatural, so contrary to our instincts, and so contrary to the laws of nature and of nature's God, that it's one of the reasons it's so destructive. And it takes a lot of despair to cause a person to go against something as natural as caring for one's child. And yet this is not only a question of a desperate act by those who might be in those circumstances. We're also dealing with something bigger, my friends. We're dealing with a war of the strong against the weak. And that's a phrase that St. John Paul II used in this document, The Gospel of Life, issued 25 years ago by that Saint John Paul II, The Gospel of Life, Evangelium Vitae. He says, there is a war of the strong against the weak. If you look at the abortion industry, Planned Parenthood being the largest part of it, they push and they scheme and they plot and they market and they strategize and they push again harder and harder and harder to have more and more abortion, to sell more and more of this product. It's a business. Don't think of this primarily as some kind of reproductive choice. It's a mega business. And they demand funding for it from various government agencies. And there are many government agencies that are funding abortion nationally and internationally and on the state level, too. Many different funding streams. These organizations demand it. They fight. They lobby. They go in there to the lawmakers. We must have more abortion funding. And we want to have more abortions. They have quotas for abortion. If you saw the movie Unplanned, you see that the inner workings of Planned Parenthood where they, they, are, they are demanding of their clinics quotas of abortions. And then, you know, we work in, in, in the United Nations, one of the many dimensions of our ministry at Priests for Life, fighting for the right to life there in these international bodies like the United Nations and also the Amer Amer Association of, uh, the, uh, of American States, Organization of American States, we're there too. And we go into these meetings and we see the fighting that these mega organizations, again, like Planned Parenthood, many others like them, and that the billionaires who back these entities, they'll go in there and they'll fight like crazy for an expansion of abortion. And we even had Hillary Clinton, one of the big promoters of abortion, say five years ago that one of the biggest obstacles in the way are these religious beliefs that stand in the way of abortion, and those creeds must be changed. People must change their, their dogmas it's like a locomotive, brothers and sisters. Don't, don't think of this just as some kind of personal individual choice. There's a locomotive engine worldwide, well-funded, well-planned, well-connected politically, slick and smooth and media-trained, infiltrating education, infiltrating business, infiltrating the church, infiltrating the healthcare industry, infiltrating the government, infiltrating indi uh, international organizations and treaties and, and commitments and, and, or, and, and alliances beyond the scope of what you can ever imagine. We have seen it face to face. We've seen, I've seen national leaders from other countries 
practically in tears and angry at some of these meetings, saying, why is the United States, now this would have been under uh, Obama and, and Clinton administrations, not under President Trump uh, uh, or any other pro-life president, but under these other Democrat administrations, I've seen these leaders in tears and filled with anger saying, why is the United States imposing upon our people a regime of abortion, insisting that we change our laws that protect unborn children. Why are you insisting that we do this before you help us feed our people and educate our children? And that's foreign policy under a Democrat administration. It's a war of the strong against a weak. There's the, the weak. There's no other way to say it. And that's why I chose the first reading today from the book of Esther. You heard the prayer of Mordecai, a Jewish man living in the Persian Empire where the king had decided to exterminate the Jews because they said, oh, these are people that follow other laws and other customs and they don't, they don't respect the authority of the king and a plot was hatched to destroy the Jewish people. But it just so happens that Mordecai's adopted daughter, his niece actually, whom he adopted as a daughter, became... The queen, the king didn't realize that she, what her ethnic background was, that she was one of the Jewish people. But she was so beautiful and he took her as the queen, Queen Esther. This You read about this in the book of Esther in the Old Testament. And Mordecai brought to Esther's uh, uh, awareness, to her attention, this plot being hatched against the Jews that on a certain day they would all be exterminated. And the queen was not allowed to go into the presence of the king unless he summoned her, otherwise she risked the death. But the king did. She took that risk to save her people. Mordecai said to her, maybe you were born for just the time as this. And, and that phrase now has come to be well known in Christian circles when we realize the opportunities God gives us, maybe after many years of preparation, we're there at the right time in the right place for the right mission to save human lives just for such a time as this. Mordecai said to Esther, go into the presence of the king. You have to do this to intercede for your people. So she did it, and it succeeded. And the king reversed the decree and killed the enemies of the, the, the Jewish people instead of the people themselves. A beautiful story of taking a risk to save many lives. So it is with us. We were born for such a time as this to reverse this war of the strong against the weak, to reverse this war. Mother Teresa called it a war as well. You know, I got to know her in the uh, mid-1990s when I took over Priests for Life. She loved our ministry. She wrote a letter to priests and deacons urging them to join up with our ministry and, and all, all faithful believers as well. So please consider it an invitation from Mother Teresa if you get involved with our ministry. And she called it a war against the unborn child. And she used that, that also, that phrase, when she spoke in Washington, D.C. at the National Prayer Breakfast in 1994. John Paul II said in this document, furthermore, that when a government allows the killing of the unborn, it becomes a tyrant state. Now, that's a strong, that's a strong piece of terminology. That's strong language. But it's Pope and St. John Paul II, who wrote it in number 20 of Evangelium Vitae. By the way, you want to see this document, study it, read it, look at a study guide about it, gospeloflife.org, gospeloflife.org. It's a tyrant state, he says. It's the death of true freedom. It's a caricature of democracy. And when a state legalizes abortion, when a government supports Roe v. Wade, when a political candidate and a political party like the Democrat Party in the United States go for abortion without limits, even in the seventh, eighth, and ninth months of pregnancy, healthy mothers of healthy babies having abortions, it's legal. John Paul II says, when that happens, the disintegration of the state itself has begun. And he says the, the perverse significance of this is absolute power over others and against others. I'm quoting the document. Absolute power over others and against others. Again, a war of the strong against the weak. Like that Persian king 
was going to execute against the Jewish people and Esther and Mordecai intervened, so must we intervene. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do that is we vote. The bishops of the United States have called us to the same responsibility in this gospel, this document, Living the Gospel of Life, a challenge to American Catholics. You can learn about this one at gospeloflife.net. So two, two Gospel of Life, Life websites. gospeloflife.net, that will bring you to the bishop's document. gospeloflife.org, that will bring you to the pope's document. These documents are interrelated. This one was issued in 95. This one came three years later to apply the teachings of this one to the United States. And the bishops here say, along the lines of what John Paul II said, that we, the, you know, legalizing abortion means an absolute power over and against others. The bishops here said, again in reference to legalizing abortion, in Democrat Party, please take note, when American political life becomes an experiment on people rather than for and by them, it will no longer be worth conducting. We are arguably moving closer to that day. The law must protect life, otherwise the law becomes tyranny. You know, it's ridiculous when people say, oh, well, we don't, we, we don't have to protect these children by law, but, you know, we'll create the circumstances that make it less, uh, put less pressure on women to get abortions or make it easier for them to choose life. Well, of course we have to create the circumstances that help women to choose life. Like I said at the beginning of this homily, that's the bulk of the work of the pro-life movement. That's the bulk of our work. We come alongside these moms, these scared moms and these dads, and we help them. Of course we help them. And we'll join hands with anybody to help make that happen. But since when do you say, oh, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to join hands and we're going to help the poor and we're going to make it more uh, uh, doable for them to, to find the resources they need and have the food and the clothing and the shelter and the employment but they, that they need, but we're not going to protect their lives under the law. We're going to try to reduce the uh, pressure on parents to, uh, God forbid, abuse their children, but, you know, if they do it, we're going to recognize it as a legal choice, that they can throw their child out the window or throw them on the train tracks or throw them in the garbage. That's not going to be against the law anymore. Oh, but we're going to work to make sure that they never want to do that. That's how absurd it is when people say, and we hear leading Democrats say this all the time, oh, well, we're, you know, this is how we protect the unborn, that you know, we make it easier for you know, the moms not to feel like they don't have to have an abortion. Again, we do that. And we agree with that a thousand percent. But you don't then turn around and say, oh, but we don't have to protect them. That's absolutely ridiculous. That's like taking your right to life away, taking the protection away from your life. And, you know, well, listen, we'll do our best to convince the people around you not to kill you. So we pray for the protection of these babies. And we pray that all the voters in this election will, like Esther, like Mordecai, intervene when they see this danger, when they see this war of the strong against the weak, will intervene by casting that vote for public officials, public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. Because friends, and again, Democrat Party, take note, if a politician can't respect the life of a little baby, how is he supposed to respect yours and mine? Let's vote, and let's vote pro-life. God bless you.